So we, we began to feel a little better about this when we came across the, the Washington State Institute approach to this because it was one that had worked in Washington and made it possible to talk to policymakers there uh, and actually had an impact on the decisions that they made. Uh, and because as far as we could see, uh, it might work a little better in talking to policymakers uh, in other jurisdictions. Now Washington is, you know, Washington is one of those places where good government is what they do. So you have to be hesitant about importing techniques from good government states to you know, New York or New Jersey or <laughs> Rhode Island or some of the other places where, but, but nonetheless, <coughs> we, we, thought, we thought we'd have a better shot. So uh, we looked at what they did. They, they started out, as far as I can tell, thinking about criminal justice. And this was unusual, because as I said, most cost-benefit people start out in different areas, often with capital. Um, this was also the first time I'd seen, and I'm sure it's not the first time it was done, but it was the first time I had seen, uh, and I found it very persuasive, a, a meta-analysis of evaluation studies. Since then, uh, with Mark Cohen and others, we've heard about other meta-analysis, but the idea of, of accumulating data from lots of different evaluation studies, um, and then trying to analyze them, not just accepting the data, but looking at it critically, uh, and by critically I mean if, they, if the study has a small n uh, or isn't a, a, a random, random assignment or something like that, they discount the, the results uh, by some systematic factor. Uh, and I was very impressed with that. I said, oh, this is cool. You're actually going out, you, you, you are getting evidence and you're trying to take that evidence into account in a systematic way. Uh, so I thought that was really neat. For criminal justice, I think they have something like on the order of 600 uh, studies now that they've evaluated, analyzed, collected data about. I think it was 571 the last time we looked, but it's probably more by now. Um, they use this net program cost idea, and they're careful about trying to figure out what the um, other uh, offsetting costs are. So for example, um, boot camp. One of the things that juveniles are sometimes uh, pr presented with as an uh, alternative to uh, incarceration with like the bars and stuff, uh, or the razor wire anyway, I don't know whether they do bars for juveniles. Um, boot camp uh, is, has a positive cost-benefit analysis, but only because it's less expensive than keeping the kids in uh, institutional settings. Uh, so, you know, that, that's pretty good. This one's very important because in talking to budget people, they separate out and have different columns, one for taxpayer benefits, the other for total benefits. I actually like three columns. I like taxpayer benefits, victims, and other social costs, and then the total um, because I think it makes it easier. And you can then say to the budget people, look, if you don't like these total numbers, you can focus on the taxpayer benefits. And somewhere over the course of uh, the next few years, what this analysis says is taxpayers as a whole will save money by going ahead with this. And that's an idea that has some appeal to, to budget folks. And then they also did some very important work, which we have to do, somebody has to do, uh, in some other states about uh, recidivism. So they get really detailed information uh, that they used as the basis for uh, their analysis. Um, since we don't have that, we're mostly relying on the Washington data and, um, and trying to uh, analyze what we can about New York and other places. So this was, this, uh, just as it stood, had more appeal uh, because it presented a, a, a better, a better uh, I'm sort of my own test case, you know, so if, as a budget guy, if this starts to make sense to me and I begin to understand it and I think it may have some value, then I think it will for other budget people. That's the per, per participant idea is a nice one because it's simple. We can all understand it, right? So both costs and benefits for uh, participants, not for the whole program. Um, this was a lot of fun, the scenarios idea. This really was neat. Uh, they, um, they were asked by the state legislature to come up with a, uh, some ideas about uh, eliminating the necessity for building an additional prison. Actually, I think two additional prisons. 
Um, and they said, okay, we'll work on it. And they came back to them with a package of programs. And they said, we think if you go ahead with this package of programs, which requires an investment, but they really meant it this time, uh, then you won't have to spend the money to, uh, to build those uh, prisons. And we think we can show you why that's the case. And the Washington State Legislature uh, bought that, uh, went ahead with it, and made some other improvements and strengthened the, the, the oversight of these programs in some ways that was trying, trying to assure that they were rigorous about the implementation of the programs and that you'd really get the benefits that were promised. Uh, careful is probably the, not the right word for what Steve does, but he's, he's quite a rhetorician. Uh, so he doesn't, when he talks to legislators and policymakers, he doesn't talk like an economist. He says, I can show you how to be penny pinchers and crime fighters at the same time. That'll wake them up. That's cool. Um, so this broader idea about trying to express these things in, in words that make sense to people and where they can actually uh, 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 identify with them if they're uh, folks with, who get elected uh, is an important one as well. Um, we have a number of ideas that, about steps we think that can Im improve this a little bit, uh, that may make it, uh, uh, and some of these Steve likes and is working on himself uh, before we suggested it to him. but uh, the. For example, uh, the, the data, getting data about, this just comes back in terms of taxpayer savings. It doesn't say state or local. It doesn't say corrections courts. It doesn't say police jails. Uh, so if you can begin to try to figure out what the, what the savings are with more discrete units of the governments that are associated with this, that gets more persuasive and allows you actually to uh, if you believe it's really going to work, it would actually allow you to let people participate in uh, the programs in ways that reflected the savings that they might uh, expect. Um, we need to begin to get better data for this from states where we're going to do this kind of work. Um, or we need to assure ourselves that Washington data or national data or something like that uh, is, uh, is sufficiently characteristic of these other places. The problem is that the, the policymakers themselves don't believe it. So it's a tough sell. Even if, you, even if you had good data that said, look, recidivism in New York is going to look just like Washington, they're saying that's not true. Our juveniles are tougher. Our situations are worse. Uh, our slums are poorer. You know, I mean, they, whatever it is, they would, they would say, no, it won't work. Our costs are higher. That may be true. You know. <laughs> Uh, it's actually not too hard to get the cost data. Uh, we need to get more discussion and debate about some of these methodological questions. Um, uh, we, we were doing uh, a more traditional cost analysis. We weren't doing regression analysis in part because it's obvious, for example, that if you look at the impact of falling crime on police costs in New York, there's no relationship in New York City, right? because mayors continue to maintain the police force at the existing levels, and it doesn't shrink as crime shrinks. So, but wouldn't you like to try to figure out how it might shrink, uh, perhaps, if you could? Uh, not so easy to do. But trying to, so um, we were able to get some data from closings of various different facilities, and what the budget offices estimated those uh, savings were going to be. We were able to generalize with those a little bit. We were able to use some, um, some data on, um, on um, rates that are charged to local governments for state facilities for juveniles and throw out some of the uh, overhead costs and begin to focus on the operating costs and try to turn those into marginal costs. So there were some steps we were able to take uh, analytically without doing statistical regression. <coughs> Um, although it wouldn't hurt to try to do this statistics as well. We just didn't have the data and didn't have this, the time. This last one is an interesting one, this payback analysis. You know, a lot of people, when they do investments, they say, or if you're going to put in solar panels, for example, one of your questions is going to be, how soon will they pay for themselves? 
this is analysis that's done in nominal dollars, not discounted dollars. The economists are not particularly persuaded that this is a good way of doing it. Uh, the finance people have other ways of, you know, of inter internal rate of return or net present value or something like that that they think are more powerful methods. But this is quite persuasive from, uh, on, to, to people who don't have those tools at hand. Uh, and it also forces you to think about savings in the near term, which again, the, that idea sometimes just sort of disappears in the big sweep of time in cost-benefit analysis. So one simple idea would be, in addition to discounted cash flow analysis, that's what DCF stands for, uh, would it be helpful to try to do payback? So we're, we're trying to think of different ways in which we could communicate to policymakers uh, that might be, that might give us a little bit more uh, power with the, the cost-benefit analysis. Um, a friend of mine in, in uh, Albany who runs the, or one of the units, actually one of the important units that's important to you all, uh, likes to talk about bookable savings. She said, don't come to me with ideas about savings way off in the future. I need bookable savings. That means I need savings I can put in my budget this year or next year or you know, the years that I'm doing this work on. Um, and bookable savings are different from the cost-benefit idea of taxpayer savings, right? Because the taxpayer savings are a single present value, the bookable savings, uh, but, that, but the, the savings that added to that stretch out into the future. Um, so they still won't be equal, um, but they can, you can begin to have more of a conversation. And Michael and I have both agreed on this, which is that if you can say to budget people, to go back to the very beginning of this discussion, if you can say to budget people, this program works, and we can show you that it works, and we can give you some estimate of cost and The first part, that this program works, and here's how we know that it works, is in and of itself quite powerful. Uh, because they don't get an awful lot of proposals that have proven themselves to work. They get a lot of proposals that somebody's cooked up because it sounds like a good idea, or because it sounds clever, or because it might work, or because it's a politician's favorite idea, or something like that. Uh, and that doesn't mean that those won't turn out to be the next generation of programs that work, uh, and we should figure out ways to deal with those, right? And ways to present those in their best light, and ways to build evaluation and other things into those programs. But to go to a budget person and say, this really works. I don't know what you think about all the other things, but this one works. I say, oh, okay, and it'll go to the top of the list, just from that. So, I think I'm done. I am. <laughs>